Uh, we're in chapter 22 here in the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to be looking today at verses 28 through 34. Luke chapter 22, verses 28 through 34. And what we'll do is we'll begin at verse uh, 28. We'll read to verse 30, and then we'll move into verse 31 and conclude with verse 34. As you're opening your Bible, I would encourage you, uh, if you're able to be with us tomorrow, for our uh, night of prayer and, uh, and the day of fasting, please. If you can be with us, it would be a blessing as well as Friday that we might um, be able to take this week and, and dedicate it to the Lord. But here in Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse 28, Luke writes, and Jesus is speaking, But you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, it's interesting that the Lord Jesus is here giving them a promise that he's bestowing on them a kingdom, and you note that in verse 29. And uh, in verse 30, he's saying that you may eat and drink at my table. It's interesting that he is sharing with them concerning the reward that they're going to receive uh, for their faithful service to him. Uh, but that, that word of encouragement, that word of promise, actually comes after a rebuke. He had just rebuked the, the apostles, the disciples, because of their selfish ambition. They had been disputing amongst themselves as to who would be the greatest among them. And as we had seen that together last time, Jesus had made it clear that greatness is decided by God. It's not the result of a selfish ambition. It's not the result of us pursuing and, and trying to gain it in our own efforts. And, and Jesus had made that very, very clear. Um, he had taken that opportunity, the opportunity of teaching them this lesson, while they were at a meal. And he had, uh, on one occasion earlier, had actually noted this uh, for them. We had seen this in chapter 14, how he had already at a meal begun to teach him the lesson of humility and the lesson that God is the one who places you where he wants and it's God who rewards you and, and, and God's desire for us is to have humility. He had begun to teach them that lesson when he had been at this particular meal and he had noted how guests had chosen the best places at the tables. And you remember that, and as he had seen them, as they were basically scrambling for the best places, the chief places, the seats there of honor at the table, he had noted that, and then he had told his disciples not to choose the best, but actually for them to choose the lowest seat at that table. And he gave the reason in Luke chapter 14, verse 11, when he said, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And, and those words, let's be honest, those words ring hollow to most Americans, most human beings of all time, but most Americans, especially now in the 21st century, that humility actually has a reward to it because we are those who really have a tendency through the nation that we live in and through the things that we have learned over time and experience. We really do have the propensity of pushing ourselves forward, and humility is truly something that we have to learn. It's normal for, for um, people to have a lesson given to them that they forget, and that particular lesson was lost on his disciples because even though Jesus had addressed that mentality, had addressed that in chapter 14, and they continued seeking places of prominence. They were even seeking places of prominence in the kingdom of God itself. They didn't learn the lesson the first time it was given to them. And, and um, you know, as I, I look at these men and, and all, I can identify with them because I don't learn the lesson the first time God tries to teach it to me either. It takes a long time for him to finally get through to me. And so I understand them. That's one of the reasons why I actually love these guys, because they're just like us. And so what he's wanting to do is just teach them this lesson. And some lessons seem to take more time to learn, especially lessons that relate to our character. And so Jesus is teaching them what humility is. And so as he was teaching them concerning that, what he does is he, he simply directs them to look at him. Uh, remember in verse 27 how he had said there, who is greater, he who sits at the table or, or he who serves? He says, is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. And so he's saying, use me as your example. I think that that's a good thing for us to be able to do, don't you? To be able to say to somebody, use me as an example. Now, that, that takes an awful lot of... of um, 
what's the word? Um, requires us to really be sincere in our faith. You know, I, I certainly wouldn't want to try to use myself as an example to all people for all time because, frankly, I'm not always the best example. And yet, as a dad, I've tried to teach my children through example. Parents in this room probably have done the same. Try to teach them by example. Years ago, one of my sons was speaking to me, and he used a particular word that is coarse. It isn't so much as a profanity. It's not a profanity, but it is a coarse word. And uh, he used that word when he was speaking to me, and I looked at him and I said, um, I don't like that word. Don't use that word with me. And he says, Dad, it's just a word. <laughs> and this is just a hand. No, I, I, I say, <laughs> until it's on the side of your head, uh, then it's pain. No, I, I said to him, it's not just a word. word. Words have meanings. He says, people use the word all the time. It's no big deal. I said, well, I mean, that's other people, isn't it? Well, I know pastors who use that word, Dad. I said, oh, really? I said, and are they your father? <laughs> no. I said, then don't be telling me about what other pastors say. What you need to do is what your father does. You see, be an example. You know, use me as an example. You know, I don't care because let's face it, everybody in this room has two or three friends you can point to and say they're worse than me or they do it and God seems to bless them. But in our, in our lives, especially mine as a, as a father and, and as a husband and, and all, I, I, I want to be able to point to myself and say, hmm, they may do that, but do I? That, that's why Paul could, in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, could say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Use me as your example. Use me as a template, if you will. You know, as insofar as I am imitating Christ, use me as that template, you see. And so, Jesus is the one who can say that, and that's what he did. He said, I am among you as the one who serves. And so, if you're going to have an example, the greatest example to have is Jesus himself. And, and so, he's saying, you're not to continue jockeying for position. Uh, you're you're to, to learn to serve with humility. Uh, you have to learn to be a servant. And so, be, become followers of my lead. Uh, even as I have, even that night, he, he could say, even as I have just washed your feet and, and shown you uh, how to be a leader, uh, you call me teacher and you call me Lord, and that's good because that's what I am. But then, if I then be in your Lord and, and your teacher, your Lord and your master, if I have washed your feet, then you ought to wash the feet of one another. Uh, I have given you an example. And so that's what he's doing. You see, he's using himself as that great example and all. They're to follow his lead. In, in Mark chapter 9, verse 35, Mark says that he sat down and he called the 12 and he said to them, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And so Jesus Christ, the greatest in the kingdom, was the servant of all. And so that's what he's doing. He is he's sharing with them the reward, but first he has given to them a rebuke because he is saying to them, you are not to be pushing for prestige, power, and position. That is what God gives to those whom he has selected. But you follow me. The Son of Man didn't come to, to, to be served, but to serve and, and to give his life a ransom for many. And so he's saying, so use me as an example. But even though he has said to them that, uh, that it's improper to have this mentality of uh, seeking power and greatness for themselves, yet for their faithfulness, they do receive a reward. And, and he speaks of it here in verse 28 and, and, and up to verse 30. You are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom just as my father bestowed one upon me. And so in spite of your jockeying for position, I appreciate your faithfulness. You've remained faithful to me throughout my ministry. And indeed, they have remained faithful. They have remained faithful to him even when the authorities rejected him and even when the people were indifferent to him, they remained faithful to him. Now, not long before, he had fed over 5,000 people with five barley loaves and two fish. 
The result was that, that those whom he had fed wanted to take him and make him their king by force. And, and so the, he spoke to them and, and he began to challenge them. And in his teaching, as he was speaking to these people who wanted to make him into a king by force, he began to challenge them. He said, you need to eat of my flesh, you need to drink of my blood. If you don't eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life within you. And, and as he's saying that, the people are listening. They're saying to themselves, uh, this is difficult. This is a hard saying. Who can endure it? And, and in John chapter 6, verses 66 through 68, it says, from, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ the Son of the living God. And so though others had forsaken him, they had turned and they had walked away. They had heard the hard sayings that he had and, and they scratched their heads and, and they looked puzzled at one another and they turned and, and walked away to follow him no more, even though many who had heard him teach and, and some who had seen his incredible miracles and had been around him on many occasions, been fed by him and all, when it came down to them actually entrusting themselves completely to him and, and following him to the very end, to the bitter end, well, they turned and they walked away, but not these apostles. These remained faithful. They remained true to him. And, and because they have remained true and they have remained faithful, they have a reward. And so he gives to them a reward in verse 29, the reward for their faithfulness. He says, well, I bestow upon you a kingdom. You see, these are the ones who had forsaken all to follow him. I'm so used to saying that. I was just thinking about that. I, I am so used to saying that that I, I naturally assume that everybody who's hearing it agrees with it. I mean, I assume that. I really do. I assume, yep, we're to forsake all and follow after Jesus Christ. That's what a Christian is. But I'm coming to realize that uh, not everybody actually does that. You know, not everybody actually does that. They, I don't know that, that everybody who calls himself a Christian actually understands what it means to follow Jesus Christ. I'm firmly convinced that there are millions throughout the world who flat out say they are Christians and don't have a clue as to how to be born again. I went to a funeral just last Thursday, left here after the Wednesday night Bible study, and drove a few hours up north to attend the funeral of a relative, a man who was a very sweet man. I loved him. He was uh, Marie's uncle, and uh, he's a big guy. He was 6'4", 270 pounds when he was a young man. And when I met him, I, w I remember walking in, and he was Marie's uh, favorite uncle, and, and he loved his niece. And I remember when I walked in, and I met this man, and he's looking down at me, and he takes my hand in this giant paw of a hand and basically squeezes it so my head starts looking like a <laughs> thermometer. Just, And he looks at me, and he says, this is my favorite niece. You better not hurt her. No, sir, I won't. Let me go, you know. I walked outside and I said, your uncle just threatened me, man. He just threatened me. He loved Marie and Marie loved her uncle, Uncle Mondo. He, he, he died. He went home to be with the Lord, loved the Lord. While we were there at the funeral, and he had a Catholic funeral, Priest once again insisted that Mondo went to heaven because he had been water baptized as an infant. That's not why Mondo went to heaven. Mondo went to heaven because Mondo loved Jesus Christ. He had a relationship with Christ. I spoke to Marie a lot about it. Are you sure the uncle knew Jesus, honey? Are you sure? She goes, yes, he's a man who gave his heart to the Lord, and she started sharing with me some things about him. She says... You know, he had a love for Jesus Christ. You see, that's what gets you into heaven. 
But there are millions of people, millions, who believe that they're going to go to heaven because they went through a religious ritual. Because when they were an infant, they were water baptized. Or because they attended Sunday school, even have some little gold stars that they have in their Bible for perfect attendance. I've had people talk to me about how that they, uh, you know, they were raised in the church and all, and, and, and for the longest time felt that that was what guaranteed their entrance into heaven because they went to church all their lives. I remember giving an invitation and a young woman approaching after the service, and, and I was speaking to her at the, at the bottom of the platform there at the stage area, and she said to me, I was raised in a Christian home. My father is a pastor in the area. And she said to me, all of my life I've attended church, but today I gave my heart to Christ for, for the very first time I realized I did not have a knowledge of Jesus Christ. I've been raised in a Christian home. My dad is a pastor. And she said to me as I was standing down there, but today I realized I didn't know and have not known Jesus Christ. So a lot of times people will think that they're Christians because they go to church or they've had some ritual washing as a baby they attended some kind of class or whatever and all. And bottom line is, is that's not how it works at all. The way it works is when you give your heart and your trust and your everything to Jesus Christ, you follow him and, and you do so openly with full commitment. And again, I, I have assumed that many people understand that, but in reality I've come to know that many do not. But these men had forsaken all to follow him. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22, Matthew says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said. I'll make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Uh, they were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. They left everything to follow him. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, as Jesus went from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he said to him, and Matthew got up and followed him. And so these are the ones who have followed after him. These are the ones who continued with him, as he says here in uh, verse 28. You are those who have continued with me, and you have continued with me in my trials. You've gone through everything alongside of me remaining faithful. And so I bestow upon you a kingdom just as my Father bestowed one upon me. I'm giving to you a kingdom. And you're going to be there. As it says in verse 30, you're going to be on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. You are going to have responsibility in the kingdom. Now, when he speaks concerning his kingdom and all, you can consider this, you can think concerning what is called the millennial kingdom, the 1,000-year rule of Jesus Christ, uh, that rule on earth that begins right after the tribulation and after the second coming of Jesus. You see in Daniel, in chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, how, how Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, came to the Ancient of Days. They brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. These men are going to have a rulership. They're going to be like judges. They're going to be there having responsibilities. They're going to have the unique relationship in that kingdom, uh, ruling, if you will, uh, the nation of Israel, making judgment, because it speaks of them judging. That word judging there speaks of, of governing. And so they're going to have a relationship with the 12 tribes of Israel. These are the ones who in Israel have been saved. These are the ones who come through the tribulation. And, and so he's saying, I'm going to give you positions of authority in the millennial kingdom, and uh, that is what you'll be doing. He says in verse 30, you, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. Now, when he says that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, a couple of interesting thoughts about that. One is... Eating and drinking often in Scripture is a picture of enjoying yourself. It's a picture of pleasure, to be honest with you. A picture of pleasures. You're eating and drinking is another way of saying you're comfortable and you're being blessed. 
Uh, this month is Thanksgiving, and uh, you're going to be going to your, your parents' house, or you're going to be inviting friends to yours, or perhaps you'll be coming here for the Thanksgiving dinner with church family, whatever. You'll be there eating, and they're going to be giving you drink, and they're not going to get you drunk. But they are going to give you some, some you know, water and, and sparkling cider and all. And you're going to have that. You, that's what you're going to have. And, and it's a picture of, of the pleasure that you have being part of a great family. And so you're going to enjoy my kingdom is what he's saying. Now, eating and drinking in God's kingdom, you can actually see that in a literal sense too. Because some people will ask, listen, when, when the rapture happens or when I pass on and go to heaven and all, and this is just an aside, but it's interesting to me, um, are we going to be able to eat? You know, some people are going to really miss that. <laughs> are we going to be able to eat? And, uh, and the answer is yes, yes, you are. You're going to be able to eat. The rapture happens, we're with the Lord Jesus Christ. The second coming occurs, Jesus returns, sets up his kingdom. We are with him. We are in our glorified bodies. We're in our glorified bodies. In your glorified body, and I like the idea of that, a glorified body, no more diets. Oh, hallelujah. But when you're, when you're with the Lord in your glorified body, you don't have to eat to sustain yourself anymore. We have to eat, of course, to sustain ourselves, right? You get hungry, you eat, because if you don't, you die. You starve to death, right? In heaven, you don't need to eat. When you're in your glorified body in the, in, in, during the millennial reign of Christ, and when we as the saints who have been raptured and have been um, given our, our glorified bodies, when we're with the Lord, we don't have to eat anymore to sustain ourselves. And I was reading the comments from a um, particular theologian, and, and he was making the case and the point that uh, when we're in our glorified body, we do not eat for, for sustenance. We eat for pure, simple enjoyment, just for the enjoyment of it. And um, I, I understand that. <laughs> I, I do, you know. But anyway, I won't, I won't wax eloquently on that one because I can. You know, I've been on a diet now for a year. I am looking forward to going to heaven. Yeah. <laughs> I really am. But I'll tell you, um, that's what it's all about. And so when he uses this picture in verse 30, he said, you may eat and drink in my table in my kingdom. It's a picture of enjoying yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a picture of fellowship with him. And that's what I'm, he said, then that's what I'm giving to you. I'm giving you places of responsibility, and I'm giving to you as a reward for your faithfulness, I'm giving to you pleasures and joy forevermore. That's what you'll have. Now, in verse 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. This is a very, very powerful portion of Scripture. Let's look at it together. In verse 31, by repeating Simon's name, notice, Simon, Simon, by repeating Simon's name, Jesus is revealing deep concern. By repeating his name, Simon, Simon, he's revealing a great, a great sense of emotion here. He's saying something that is deeply concerning. It's like when he had said in Luke 10, 41, when, when Martha had been upset over the fact that Mary was not helping her as she was preparing a meal for Jesus and, and, her, and her guests. It's like when Jesus turned and looked at Martha and said, Martha, Martha, you're concerned about many things. It, it shows that Jesus was concerned about her attitude and the way that she was. Or it's like in Luke 13, verse 34, when Jesus was there looking at the city of Jerusalem 
Jerusalem, and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. So when he said Simon twice, it shows us that there's great, great concern in him. He is saying something to him that, that has a great emotion and great urgency. Now, I want you to notice, he says to him, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. So, Simon, when he says to him the first time, Simon, Simon, I, I want you to remember that that's his, his given name. Simon is his given name. It's the name that, that he had before he had been called. When Jesus called him to follow him, Jesus actually gave him a new name. In John 1, it says, when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. You're going to be Peter. And so he gave him a new name, but now he's referring to the old name. So it gives me some insight into the fact that he's saying, as a natural man, you're going to go through some sifting tonight. Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Satan has gone to God himself is the point he's making and has requested you by name and has obtained permission from God to sift you. That's what he's saying here. That's the literal way it's, it's, being, it's being spoken of. So this gives to us the insight. It gives to us a revelation as to who is behind all the pain that Simon and the rest of the apostles will suffer that night. Who is behind that pain? The enemy. The pain that they're going to endure and the denial that the apostle Peter will, will be um, guilty of was instigated by Satan himself. So that gives us insight into the experience of testing and its effect in our lives. Because notice with me, and I want you to see this, he says, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. All you need to do is ask yourself, and a lot of us perhaps may not know how wheat was sifted during the time of Christ. It was put into a, into a container, and it was shaken violently. And as it was shaken violently, the chaff, the, the covering of the granules of wheat, uh, would be separated from the wheat granules itself. And there was a, a, like a mesh, and so the grain actually sifts through and, and falls to the ground while the chaff will cling to or be blown away by the wind. When you go to Israel, you'll actually go up, and you can see this, there'll be hills, and they'll say that's where they used to thresh the wheat. And, and what they would do is they would take the wheat and they would shake it. The wind would blow away the chaff. Some of it would stick on that basket, and the rest, the, the granules or the grain, would actually sift through and go to the ground. But when Jesus is speaking concerning Satan's sifting, it tells us it's going to be a violent attack. That's the point he's making, because sifting is violent. And he's saying, Satan has asked for you. He's obtained permission. He went directly and asked God for you. And he's obtained permission that he might sift you, that he's going to cause you pain and you're going to endure it. There's going to be violence in your life. And so, by application, testing of our faith can be very violent. And it shakes us to the core. It can be severe when our lives are being sifted. It can get to the point where you say, I can't take anymore. It's as far as I can go. I, 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 God, I, I, I can't take this anymore. The psalmist in Psalm 66 verse 10 said, You, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. How is silver refined? It's heated up comes to a boiling point, and the residue, that which is impure, rises to the top and is skimmed off. The same is true for gold. Isaiah 48.10 says, I have refined you, but not as silver. I've tested you in the furnace of affliction. And so you're going to be going through something, Simon. It's going to be violent, but it's also going to be effective in removing that which is not necessary in your life to reveal that which is. Now, trials, every believer goes through trials. 
Trials are used by the Lord to refine our faith. And, and trials have a way of drawing us closer to the Lord. And trials have a way of purifying us. That's what uh, Peter in 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7 says. He has some acquaintance with trials and he can speak with experience. He says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. James in chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 said, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. And so when God allows a trial into your life from his perspective, it's intended to refine you and purify you. That's why when Satan says, I want to sift him, that's why the Lord God would give permission, because he knows that, that um, it's going to refine this man by the name of Peter. Now, trials are not identical to temptations. Temptations generally are different because they are instigated by the enemy with the intention of destruction. He wants to destroy you. He wants to do something to overwhelm you. The Bible tells us, for example, that it was Satan who brought temptations to Jesus there in the wilderness. His intent was evil. James tells us in chapter 1, verse 13, he says, Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. When he says, nor does he himself tempt, that word tempt means to entice or solicit to evil. God does not entice or solicit you to evil. He doesn't tempt you. Satan is the tempter, but God will allow trials into my life to purify me. Satan is trying to cause the apostle Peter to fall completely, to be destroyed. The way that, the way that Judas denied the Lord and ultimately ended up killing himself. And so what happens is Satan requested permission to sift him, and he got permission. That gives us insight. He's not free to attack us whenever he desires, and nor can he use all of his power. When Satan, in Job chapter 1 and 2, when Satan appeared before God, and God said to him, give an account of yourself. What have you been doing? Satan said to him, I have been going throughout the earth. When we studied Job, I, I, I took great pains to try and point this out to you, and found in chapters 1 and 2 of Job, that, that God was actually calling Satan to an account. God was saying, give an account of yourself. Where have you been? Because I know you're up to no good, so I want you to to say that, to be very clear about it. Where have you been? I've been throughout the earth. What have you been doing throughout the earth? Well, basically what Satan's saying, I've been up to no good. And so that's why God says to him, have you considered my servant Job? In other words, I know what you've been up to. I know you've been trying to find weakness in those who profess faith in me. Have you considered him? Have you looked at him and scrutinized him? Have you looked closely at him trying to find a weakness in him? And when you read Job, you'll discover immediately that, that Satan has an answer. Yes, yes. You put a hedge around him, and I can't touch him. You know the story. God says, you can't touch his body, but do what you will. Limited power. He ends up losing all of his wealth and loses his children. And then chapter 2, Satan appears again. Have you considered my servant Job? You're protecting him, but if you touch his skin... Skin for skin, all that a man has, he'll give for his skin. You touch his skin, he'll curse you to your face. God says, go, but you can't take his life. And then the rest of the book of Job unveils before us. Satan wanting to test, wanting to destroy, limited 
in his ability to do so. He can only tempt when given permission, and he's restricted by God. In the case of Job, James speaks about that in chapter 5, verse 11, and he says, you've heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. You see what happened in the case of Job. It was proverbial, and it was repeatedly spoken of in Scripture, and you see that God delivered him and what happened. What's interesting to me, and I always like to point this out, because when you study the book of Job and you see all that he went through and all, and the Scripture uh, consistently says that he wouldn't sin against the Lord with his mouth, but ultimately what happens is he's been questioning the Lord, and finally the Lord breaks into his time of questioning and, and says to him, gird yourself like a man, and now I'm going to ask you some questions and you answer me. And God begins to give a series of questions there in the book of Job in the latter chapters, and, and finally Job Job says, you know, he says, I, 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 I abhor myself in, 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 in sackcloth and ashes. He said, uh, I, I'll put my hand over my mouth. I have spoken, uh, t- spoken suddenly concerning you with, without knowledge. And, but what he says to him is, he says, I heard of you with the hearing of my ear, but now I see you with the seeing of my eyes. Now, what an interesting thing. I've heard of you but I've never had a personal acquaintance with you. Not like this, which I find interesting because the Lord had said, I have no one on earth as righteous as Job. So he's a great example of somebody who walks by faith and not by sight, the way that you and I do, the way that we do. Job's friends gave him the best comfort that they could possibly give and the best advice that they could possibly give when they just sat there and didn't say anything. When they started talking is when you started getting some problems. Even his wife said, curse God and die. Thank you, sweetheart. I appreciate your advice. (laughs) What an encouragement. But he trusted in the Lord God did correct him in some of the things that he was incorrect in. But Job's last statements that he's making to us, I heard of you, but now I've seen you, gives me insight into how God works something through these trials. And that's what happens when you go through deep things is you get a clearer vision of God, and that's how it works. Notice in verse 32, though, the Lord Jesus says, I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you've returned to me, strengthen your brethren... I've made intercession for you. Jesus is called our high priest. I have made intercession for you. And this is all going to work out for you. And ultimately what will happen is you're going to grow. And as a result of what you've gone through, because you are going to deny me, as a result of what you've gone through, you're going to have an ability to encourage and strengthen your brethren. Because what you're about to endure through your denial And this great failure is going to give to you something you don't have yet. It's going to give to you empathy. It's going to give to you understanding. It's going to give to you humility. It's going to awaken in you compassion. I remember somebody one time saying, I just don't know how that person could do that. And me, I have to tell you, I know exactly how they could do that because I used to do the same thing. When we get to the point where we start looking out there saying, how could they be that way and do that? We're forgetting that we would be doing the same thing without Jesus Christ in our life too. We're no better. None of us are, are we? We're no better. And so what happened in his life is he gained compassion and understanding. He he, he gained an empathy and, and, and he did return to the Lord. And from that perspective, he was able to say to them, been there, done that, Jesus Christ is faithful and gracious and he will forgive you too. What is a blessing to me is the phrase that Jesus gives here though. Notice verse 32, I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you. And you are not going to be completely lost. Paul said, There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that ye may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And that's what he does. He makes a way 
There's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. Every person has gone through something similar. You're not unique in this. You may be thinking that what you're going through, you're the only person who's ever done that. And Paul would say that's not true at all. It's common to man because men are, are ensnared by, by, by fleshly sins and all, in, and, and it's a common experience for all. He said, but God will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability to endure. You're not going to get to the point where you cannot be successful. God is going to make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. When he says he will make a way of escape, it's a picture of you being in a cave with the enemies coming up the side of that hill to take you, and then you discover at the back of the cave something you hadn't seen, an escape route. And all this time you've been thinking that you're about to be taken when in reality there's a way out, and that's what he does. See, you don't have to yield to the temptation. You don't have to give in. I don't have to give in. The Holy Spirit is speaking to me, and he's saying, you know this is wrong. You've been studying the Word long enough to know this is not a good thing. But, Lord, I desire this. I'll make a way of escape for you. You'll be able to bear it. You're just not looking for the way of escape. So you're backsliding, and you go to a club or go to a bar, you go to a friend's house, whatever. And you meet somebody there. And they're kind of like friendly. And you're drinking a little bit with them. And before you know it, you ask them, you want to come back to my place? And they say, sure, why not? So you're thinking within yourself, oh, this is going to end up pretty good tonight. Take them back to your place. Start doing what you're doing. And before you know it, all the bells and whistles are going off. And you're getting to that point where you're saying, I'm not turning back. We're going to go to the bedroom. And you're saying to yourself, I can't help myself. You know, I, once, once, once everything's in gear, there's no turning back. And a lot of people say that. I just, you know, they've said it to me, Pastor, I fell. I fell. Just didn't have the willpower. Didn't have the strength. Really? No, once everything started was started going and proceeding in that way, I've been there before. I wasn't about to stop. I couldn't stop it. And the question would be asked, well, let me ask you a question. If just before you were to consummate that act, just before you fornicated, just before you fornicated, if that person, by the way, said to you, I have infectious HIV, and if we proceed, you are going to get it, would you continue? Would you? The answer is, are you kidding me? Because all of a sudden, man, no thank you. Cold water has just poured all over your hormones. <laughs> Hasn't it? Don't you, at that point, wouldn't you say, uh-uh, this isn't worth dying for. This is not worth dying for. Anybody with wisdom would say that. This is not worth dying for. Wait a minute. Fear of God and love for Jesus didn't stop you. Fear of AIDS did. Fear of AIDS did. That ought to reveal something to your heart, about your heart, huh? That I can control myself. I just choose not to. That I can make decisions, I just choose to make the ones that I want. See, that's the difference between actually being sincere and saying, I really want to serve the Lord, and being kind of like a part-time disciple when it's convenient or easy, you see? The thing that I think is most important to take from this is the fact that you can have victory. Jesus is praying for you even now. He is our high priest who ever lives to make intercession for us. And we can have victory in him. Now, as Jesus is saying to him these things, what does he say? We'll close briefly here, verses 33 and 34. He says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. He said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you know me. No, your, your heart is willing, and right now in the passion of the moment, you would go so far as to say that you would even die for me. You would say that you would even go to prison for me. 
Well, your heart is willing, but your flesh is weak, and you are going to fail. It is going to happen. And so, in pride and self-will, the apostle Peter ultimately is going to fail. But the thing that I want to emphasize is that Jesus knew it before he did it and told him, I have prayed for you. He prayed for the apostle, and he's praying for me. And that gives me great hope in these last days, to know that the one that I love with all of my heart and I'm learning to love more every day, he's still praying for me. Hebrews 7, 25 says, He is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And so Jesus Christ can save us to the uttermost. As somebody once said, from the guttermost to the uttermost, and that's how it is with the Lord. He took us and transformed us, and even to this day, he prays for us. He's our high priest who ever lives to make intercession for us. My encouragement to every one of us, beginning with me and all through this place, is this, is listen, we don't surprise the Lord when we fail, but we shouldn't use that as an excuse to continue failing. We ought to be asking the Lord every day, give us the strength to remain faithful to you today, Lord, especially in these last days when your church needs to live a, a holy life. We need to walk worthy of the gospel. We need to be examples of believers. And so, Lord, in Jesus' name, I would ask, as you continue to pray for me, that I would continue to trust and rest in you. And, Lord, when I do fail, well, I know that you, you will bring me back, and I know that the things that I have gone through can be used as illustrations to encourage others to remain faithful to you. Much of the, much of the exhortation that you hear from this pulpit, where I say, be careful about this and don't do that, much of it comes because I have failed and I have done those things that I'm warning you about. Because it comes through hard times sometimes. And it gets, in my life, it, I just want to warn you because if you love the Lord like I love the Lord, I want to save you pain. I want to save you pain. I used to tell that to my kids. I'd say, I just don't want you to have my testimony. I don't want you to go through what I went through. I want to save you from that because I still to this day carry scars in my heart from things I did before I came to Christ to this day. And I don't want you to go through the things that I went through. And I did my best to try and help them to know. But even when they did fail, I knew that God would take that which was intended for evil and could use it for good, even as he did in the life of the Apostle Peter.